Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and take note of AJR, three brothers, Adam, Jack, Ryan. That is where the A, the J, and the R come from, their first names. Their last name is Metzger. They live together in New York City, which is where they began playing music, busking together for hours at a time for years. Their breakout hit came in 2012 with I'm Ready, a song whose success they owe in no small part to Sia, who was one of the many musicians that they admired from afar that they sent a link out to, Cold. So this interview is with the J and the R faction of AJR. Why don't you say hello, fellas? Hey, I'm Ryan. I'm Jack. And we are from the band AJR. So hopefully that will help you figure out who is who when they each talk. They have been doing a lot of cool stuff recently, including their 2020 singles Bang and Bummerland, the former of which you may have seen them performing on a float during the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, which probably helped the single reach number one on the all-genre song sales chart this week. They're also doing a very special virtual concert on December 26th, or Boxing Day if you're Canadian. But before all this, their earliest musical memories are of another set of musical brothers. Let's let them tell you all about it. I have a lot of memories of the Beach Boys, I think. Uh, Our our dad used to play us a lot of Beach Boys. Um, I have memories of like being in the car on the way to the beach, listening to like Surfer Girl. And I remember that being one of the first moments I thought, oh, these, this is catchy. Like this is a melody that Elicit, elicit some kind of emotional response. Do you remember Adam as a, as a role role model, like influencing your musical tastes and, and what you'd listen to, or, or was it mostly your parents at that time? No, I think just our dad. Yeah, he was like an ultimate music lover with a classic dad with the thousands of record collection. You know that that whole thing. So it, it, he was dying for us to love music. You know, to pa- at least pass that on. And, yeah. and Ryan, what, what what are your earliest musical memories? Oh, I'm mean, sorry. Sorry, Jack. I could lie and come up with a new. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's got to be the same thing, honestly. I mean, I, I, I mean, a little bit past that, I think I remember just kind of singing along to that stuff and learning, I guess, how to first harmonize with Ryan and Adam. You know, I think I think for some reason, I think people are just born with, you know, better understandings of music and why it sounds good. I think we, uh, the three of us were. Um, and then it was a fun moment when we first started to, you know, we would listen to the Beach Boys or Frankie Valley, And then the three of us would go like, da, 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 and like harmonize all three together. And it was like, oh my God, what an amazing feeling. So we would just spend hours on the car ride, just harmonizing together and practicing that skill. Obviously you've, you've collaborated before, but have you ever tried singing with people who aren't your blood relatives and noticed a difference? Yes, it doesn't sound as good. <laughs> we did, yeah, we've done a few collaborations. Um, I used to say we we went on tour with Ingrid Michaelson, and me, me and her would sing a song um, on stage together. And I always remember, and I think it sounded really good. I watched back the videos, but I remember it just feeling weird, you know, because we 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 did it for so long just with my brothers. It felt weird to go anywhere outside of that circle. It's interesting to think about, like you said, your dad imbued you with a sort of music history, and which band of brothers do you relate to most? Hmm. Uh, probably the Beach Boys. Yeah, I guess it has to be the Beach Boys. Yeah. Yeah, just the, I mean, we've seen every, you know, documentary and biopic and everything. And that just, the, the, their their closeness and excitement behind making the music. And, you know, obviously in their good times, I know there were bad ones too. But but th- that, that most closely resembles, I think, how we feel when we're writing. Tell me about the extended family. Is there any sort of Mike Love on the periphery who <laughs> <laughs> wanted to get in on the action? No, we don't really have a very big extended family i think it's 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 fairly small it's really just been the three of us yeah that that would be funny though if we did have that person i would be part of that too yeah <laughs> uh and just to watch all those disagreements they have now in their in- current incarnation it's oh so yeah sad. yeah we just heard about the most recent one about uh yeah, him, yeah about mike love and brian wilson saying yep that's not us <laughs> yeah And how did you take it from harmonizing the backseat to realizing that this was something you really loved and and, and, uh, was busking the very first thing you started doing from there? It was the very first thing. It was really the only thing we could do. Uh, You know, we didn't really know anyone in the industry. A lot of people are like, yeah, I'm famous. And how'd you get there? Oh, my uncle works at this label or, you know, uh, that just wasn't the case with us. We had zero connections. We didn't really have any money either to, you know, go out and buy anything. So 
the only real option to kind of kill two birds with one stone money and, you know, practice was street performing. So we would go out every single day for like four or five summers straight. And uh, we would just basically sing covers and do little dances to people who were, you know, walking by and we would get a dollar every once in a while. And at the end of each day, we would basically take all the money we had and go buy something from the music store. One day we would make 30 bucks and we'd buy a ukulele. One day we'd make like two or 300 bucks and we'd go buy something, some, you know, recording equipment. And then from there it was, okay, let's start actually practicing writing original songs. And that was really just eight years of hard work of failing a lot. And then finally got to the point of, okay, we, we've gotten good enough that people start caring. What neighborhood were you performing in? Would you go all around? Would you go in it right was, near home? Or Yeah, you... it was three main spots. It was, it, was, it was any of the parks. It was Central Park, Washington Square Park, or Union Square. Usually Washington Square was where we got the biggest, <laughs> biggest draw. How many street performances do you really reckon you did up until that point? Was it like, like hundreds, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it was really, I mean, we, we would do it every summer, four summers in a, maybe four or five summers in a row. Yeah. And every day it was about six to seven hours straight, you know, wow. just constantly in the park. So it, we would do our set, which was probably an hour, so probably five or six times throughout the day. So yeah, hundreds. Wow. Yeah. It, would your folks go with you? Oh, absolutely. Our dad yeah. was always photographing us, uh, you know, from like across the park and he would kind of sit there for hours and people would be like, Hey, like if you're going to photograph them, you should at least give them money. And he would go, you know, I've given them more <laughs> money than you can imagine, my friend, you know, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Did, did he play anything as well? You know, my, my dad is just like, he doesn't really have a good sense of music <laughs> like playing. He, he reads, he's been playing the drums for 30 years and he's as good as he was on the second day that he started playing. <laughs> he's, he's not that kind of guy, <laughs> but, he loves but he just is in love with it and he will keep doing it forever. You know, he's that, he's that kind of person. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. And, and I mean, would he give you some guidance? I mean, aside from just playing stuff that he enjoyed or. Oh yeah. He, 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 couldn't help but he can't help but still do it i mean in terms of other music and commenting on our own music you know he would he still hears songs and he's like no that's bad fix this fix this and he some once in a while he gets it right but usually he doesn't really know what he's talking about <laughs> but he's 100 percent sure of it but no it's it's so sweet because you know we, we always want to keep him in the circle because he just loves it so much and he was actually responsible for you know starting our love of it yeah. I mean, so it doesn't sound like we've got a Murray Wilson on our <laughs> We make that here. joke so often where he's <laughs> going to steal all of our publishing and sell it. Yeah. What business is he in? He's an architect. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I'm not quick enough with math to figure out how old you are based on your uh, birth dates, but if you could just tell me how, that's fine, how old yeah. are each yeah, right now. Uh, Jack, I'm Jack and I'm uh, 23. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ryan, 26. Right. That's great. And so... This is your first band, and this is the only band you've been in both, right? Yeah, this is all we know. So after the street performing, we did that for four years, like four summers. And then uh, then just continued wow. to build the craft. It was just like going back to the living room where we could uh, now, because of street performing, afford some of this equipment. And just writing songs every single day, every day after school, coming home and just bam, 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 working on new new types of songs, new genres, trying out what is it like if we do an African song? What is it like if we do a folk song? Um, you know, just like really experimenting. Then probably eight years after that, um, we ended up uh, with this song called I'm Ready that at the time it was kind of the best thing we had written. It, it, it was probably the first song that we had made that really sounded like a real song, right, Jack? Like yeah, the, I think there was a moment where Ryan played the final, you know, mixer. I was like, wait, this is kind of different here. You know, it was, yeah, everyone hits that moment of, okay, this is the one. Yeah, now, yeah. now we kind of know what we're doing. And we ended up in kind of a last ditch effort of like, okay, oh, the only people that care about this band are our high school friends. And so I was in class one day in college at, at Columbia and uh, I was... Uh, tweeting the video of i'm ready to all these different celebrities it was just kind of like all right we've this is if this doesn't work i don't know what will work and sia uh who ended up uh sia ended up retweeting it and and writing to us and we ended up meeting her at her hotel for brunch in new york city um and she just kind of fell in love with the song and introduced us to people in the industry. And that's where we met uh, Steve Greenberg, who's still our manager to date. Who were some of the other celebrities on that mass tweeting campaign? It was the at Justin Bieber, at Miley Cyrus, at all those <laughs> people. Any, anyone we could think of that was on the radio. It, was there anybody that you would have been? Um, well, I mean, I guess it's shocking that I mean, it's not shocking based on the talent, but it must have felt like a shock when, when Sia did respond. But was there anybody that you were like, these people will never respond? 
it, all of them. Yeah. <laughs> really, there was no reason. I mean, when, when Sia did respond, I mean, if you think about it, it was it was eight years of nothing. So we were just really. It was eight years of honestly nothing and people telling us you, we're going to make you big, kid. It was like the classic cliche line from the movie, and it turned out to be some guy scamming you and stealing all your money and just. Right. You know? uh, so we were we were kind of conditioned to believe that we would never make it, and that everyone that, that, there, that there's such a great divide between us and anyone that can actually help us. But it turns out that that was not true. <laughs> and Sia couldn't have been nicer and kinder to us. And it was just, it was pure luck, honestly, <laughs> that, that it appeared on her feet at that time. So during the, the, those eight years, are you all basically teaching yourself how to play these instruments and, and learn the recording software? Or are you taking lessons or? A hundred percent self-taught, honestly. That's I mean, great. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think it might be the way we learn the best, really, yeah. just watching YouTube videos and just figuring it out. Yeah, I think mo- even more than YouTube videos, just like figuring it out, it's just writing and producing a lot of bad songs. Is <laughs> It's really just a totally okay thing to do. And I think it's frowned on a lot, especially now in a culture where we're all, everybody's really interested in going viral right now. Like, wh- wow, this is the first song I ever made and it went viral on TikTok. Okay, now now you don't have any of the tools to make a follow-up. You don't know what it's like, to, if that was your flute, you don't know what it's like to write a bad song and try to save that bad song and turn it into something good. You don't have those tools in your toolbox. And I think us writing probably a, a thousand uh, not good songs before I'm ready has just equipped us with this ability now to uh, fail well, you know, when we, when we're writing songs now. Right. That's, that's a really good way of putting it. When you did transition from busking and, and, you know, just recording on your own to this ability to have, you know, you had failed enough times and and it was your chance to not fail. Talk to me a little bit about that transition. Yeah. So we, uh, we got discovered by Sia. She introduced us to our manager, who a big reason we were drawn to our manager is um, she, she introduced us to three different labels, Sony, Universal, who are obviously the two major labels, and then this guy, Steve Greenberg, who had an independent label and, by the way, decided he didn't even want to sign us to the independent label. He said, I want to be your manager instead. And the reason mm. we went with Steve is because he said, y- you guys are, are right the way you are. The songs you're making are great. I'm Ready is, is a hit song waiting to be heard as opposed to the two major labels that we met with, Sony and Universal, who both said, oh yeah, I'm ready, it's fun, but let's put you in a room with Max Martin or whatever, whoever the big songwriters were at the time. Let's really flesh out your sound. And that was less enticing for us. We were like, no, let's go with the guy that's excited about who we are right now. And that proved to be the right decision, I think, because even since then now, he's been just our closest, uh, he's just really in our court kind of our biggest asset our biggest (laughs) asset i think that's a good way to put it yeah he's he's so experimental with how he thinks he he did who let the dogs out he did mbop by hansen he did stacy's mom it just for over the last 30 years he's done like all the weirdest hit songs and so we're like let's go with that guy let's go with the guy that's like thinking outside the box instead of we'll make you into the next whatever band was big at the time Right. And instead of stuffing you into a box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so much more, more fun to be outside the box. Yeah. So so taking the live show, I mean, the live show now is it's a big production with it. And t- talk to me a little bit about making that uh, a reality. Yeah. So that was interesting. Now, uh, I, I guess a little bit of backstory is after I'm ready kind of did its thing, it blew up and it, it got uh, it sold I mean, back when streaming wasn't big, it actually sold a million, you know, songs on iTunes, and it and it uh, it, it ended up going platinum. And we were sure that then we would, you know, be able to tour. We'd be selling out thousands of, you know, tickets every single night. But that was absolutely not the case, and we were kind of stunned. It was it was a bit of a situation where, wow, are we a one hit wonder? And there was two years of flat no success after that, and we were huh. wondering, like, what kind of what what happened? And we realized, and this is something that we still use today, you know, in in songwriting. We we realized that. I'm Ready was a simple song about partying. And it was just about having a good time with a weird sample, Perry, and that was it. And no one really cares about the person that's singing that. No one wants to go see that person's face in concert. No one wants to pay money to see that person. And we realized that we uh, the, the, the people that they do want to see are people that they can relate to and people that they're like, dying about, oh, oh, I, I feel that too. So we started to write songs from a really honest place of... Um, 
insecurities that we had, weird thoughts that could almost even be like memes, like, like that, that we were discovering. We'd write full songs about. And we realized that fans actually started showing up. First, it was like we were selling at 150 capacity, then the 500, then the 1,000, and now it's getting up to you know, five to 10,000 people a night. And it was really just because of our lyrical change. Um, and uh, people wanted to come see the face that was singing about being weak and, uh, you know, uh, weird insecurities they had growing up. So basically, that's sort of the backstory. And then when it got time to actually put a real show together, we thought, let's try to do something different here. You know, a lot of shows, almost all shows are, you know, there is production, but it's really just kind of the artist, you know, on stage singing their music. And I'm in no, I'm in no way, you know, shitting on this. It's, it's that, that just didn't quite appeal to us just to do something that simple. And I think it came from the street performing days of needing to like overcompensate and win over people. So what we did was we created this show that was basically half concert, half Broadway show, half like magic, you know, production, weird thing. And what we did is we, you know, we made our songs and we also included these weird pieces of production and strange effects behind us and interactive features to really try to surprise the audience. And uh, we ended up, uh, you know, creating this show that is actually pretty talked about, you know, among fans. And we've managed to, you know, sell out Radio City and Red Rock. So that, that's definitely been the other half. I mean, equally as important as the music for us is the live show. Yeah, I mean, the the Tim Cherie part comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the one of the first things we did was, okay, how can we do something new? And it was, okay, let's start remixing old Disney songs and see if people <laughs> like, see what people think of that. And we did it on our opening slots and people were like, okay, maybe I should come see this band again. That's kind of weird. Yeah. The initial run you had with um, the, some of the acts you were opening up for, it, it's sometimes it seems like strange bedfellows. Other times it seems like it's a good match, but tell me about that period. That was really important, seriously. The opening is so great, um, especially for an up and coming band, especially when like, it's kind of like street performing. It depends, we've opened for people who we, you know, are a perfect fit. And like you said, we should be, have no business opening up for, and people were talking through the whole set. And that was <laughs> honestly, so the, the Ingrid Michaelson tour I brought it up before was probably the changing moment in our, uh, one of the changing moments in our career. The first kind of show we went out on stage and everyone was kind of talking through the show and we said, okay, like, how are we going to appeal to this crowd who's a little bit older than, than, than us? Um, and then we did, and we kind of made a show around that. And what we did was it, kind of an interesting story. We never told this one before. We said, okay, let's, let, let's see how we can bring these people back to a show. And what we did was we announced a headline show and we decided to play every single market that we played on the Ingrid Michaelson tour and announce those dates one at a time on the night of the Ingrid Michaelson show. So what we mm. would do was we would, you know, plan a show for Columbus. And on the night of the Columbus Ingrid Michaelson show, we go, what's up guys, we're AJR. We do our show. We say, hey, we're actually announcing a Columbus show right now for two months from now, buy tickets now. And basically all of Ingrid's fans bought tickets there and filled the hundred person, you know, venue, which led us to sell out the next tour, which kind of started a roll of, okay, who's AJR? Wait, wait a sec. Okay. Like, and then it kind of went from there. So that was super, super important. That's great. So yeah. even if like you went on your website, people would not be able to find out that you were playing in that venue. Exactly. And it, it was kind of cool because fans were actively watching, which, which city is going to be next? You know, it's, it's definitely something I advise, uh, I, I'd advise a lot of smaller artists to do it. So it's a cool, cool trick when the uh, shows open back up. Yeah. What was it? Was it um, exactly the same tour route and itinerary as the Ingrid Michael song? Pretty much. I think there was a couple uh, dates that we knew that we could sell, like New York, obviously, where we're from in LA and Chicago were probably the ones only ones added, but pretty much it was by that date. Yeah, it was, it was mm -hmm. pretty straightforward. Yeah. Oh, that's really smart. Yeah, it was It was something that I, I, we had never seen another artist do. And afterwards, we were wondering, like, wait, why don't artists do this? It's so easy for, you know, a, a someone to get on their phone and quickly buy $10 tickets just to go see a new unknown band. Right, right. Yeah. And then, you know, if they're having a good time, then they'll be right there and they'll say, well, that was fun. Let's right. do this again. <laughs> yeah. And everyone wants, to be the, everyone wants to be that first person to say, I saw them in the room of 50 people. I saw them in a room of 100 people, you know. And then, oh, that's interesting too, because you, you mentioned Ingrid Michelson's fans are a little bit older. How do you keep those fans while appealing to younger fans as well? I think it really is something that we started to not think about at some point, And it kind of just happened naturally due to how quirky the music is. We, when, we, when we have our you know, headline shows now and there are a good amount of people there, my friends always say, they were like, Jack, I was watching the show. And to my left, there was this eight-year-old kid singing every, every lyric. And then to my right, there was this 50-year-old woman singing every lyric. I can't believe how wide their demo is. And I don't think it has so much to do now with appealing to a certain age. I mean, coincident. I mean, I think our biggest age is like the college age, but I think that I 
think it just has to do with the songs. If you can relate to I'm weak and what's wrong with that, you're going to come see our show. And that could be anyone from a nine-year-old struggling, you know, in middle school or elementary school to a 50-year-old woman struggling at work. So I think it really just has to do more with the music now. Well, yeah, I got to tell you, I have a seven-year-old son and he had a bad day at first grade and I played him a hundred bad days and he loved it. Oh, that's and, amazing. You know, and oh, that's he, perfectly proving all, my point. <laughs> yeah. And and it's it which is a good segue to my next question because he'll always do the deep voice portion and how do you figure out what went in your songwriting process like those kind of fun production choices you make? Uh, yeah. I think we always say the phrase, why not, when we're writing music. Uh, uh-huh. we, we, why not is something that comes up in every single song. And it's because we got a little experimental on our f- first album, Living Room, um, which didn't have a ton of commercial success. But what people really liked about it, probably the only thing was how weird the production was and how strange it was from one song to another. And we realized, wait, okay, people like like a lack of consistency among an album. They don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. So whenever we're making a song and it's a demo and it's a piano demo, it's a really exciting moment to go, okay, what's the weirdest thing we could think of to put in here? Like that low voice. That wasn't, yeah. I think it was originally supposed to be me yeah. just going a hundred bad days. And we were like, okay, let's pitch it down. And who's this new character? You know, it makes you think a little bit. <laughs> and the production choices are all still the three of you, right? Yeah. Ryan is the one that actually physically gets on the computer and produces everything from start to finish. But yeah. Mm -hmm. What have you been, I mean, you just recently released the new single during lockdown, but Mm -hmm. uh, what what other sort of lockdown activities have you been up to? Oh man. Aside from, well, there was the drive-in concert too, right? Yeah. We did the drive-in show, which actually went really, really well. A lot better than we we, we thought it was going to go. Yeah. Um, Yeah. The live show is such a huge part of our AJR's whole brand and our whole thing. Um, so it's it feels like we're a little neutered here uh, working on this album because it's so tied in with whatever the next tour is. But uh, we're planning something in the virtual concert space um, that I don't want to talk too much about yet, but uh, we're, we're trying to kind of lift that to a new level of production value because I, I get a little upset if I like am paying money for a virtual concert and then they're just sitting there with a guitar. It's like, oh no, I want to come on, really <laughs> entice me. So we're we're trying to take that to the next level a little bit. So we're working on that right now. It is interesting how nobody's really taken it to the next level yet. I watched one last night. It was um, the Lemonheads at the Mercury Lounge or something. I, oh, oh yeah, I, which bar? And it was. I mean, it was fine. The right. sound was good, but. It's just, yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting because you can easily look up a YouTube video of of that yeah. sort of thing. So we figured, you know, if we're going to charge people money to uh, watch something on their computer, let's let's go way over the top of that. We, we I think since we're really young and starting the band, we have a really big fear of people being like, oh well, I'm I'm I guess I just won't be a fan anymore. Uh, you know, like really needing people to like us. So I think that's actually been sort of a uh, you know a benefit in creating shows. We really, really want to go over the top and overcompensate as much as possible. And that leads to, you know, these bombastic things. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It kind of all seems to tie back to the the street musician and wanting people to stay and listen, and but not totally caring if they don't, right? Right, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not a good feeling, honestly, to watch some business guy look at you, shake his head in disgust, and walk away. Your mind immediately goes to, oh no, <laughs> this guy's mad at me. What did I do wrong? How can I make him stay next time? Right, right. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, uh, I noticed, you know, you listen to the music and it's definitely fun. And and like you said, there's a certain vulnerability to it. And, and on your website, there's the, the social consciousness element of uh, getting people to contribute to the Black Lives Matter movement. What do you think is the most serious song you've ever written? Oh, wow. Great question. Um, probably Burn the House Down. Yeah, um, I, guess, I mean, serious, I guess, in, in terms of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, we wrote Burn the House Down as kind of AJR's version of a political song where mm-hmm. we're n- it's not, come on, everybody, let's rise up and stand for justice. Because that's not something I would say. That's not our personality. We're, we're, not, we're not heading, we're not leading the fight. You know, yeah, at the front. it's more of a song about like, is it okay for me to write a political song? Uh, will mm-hmm. they let me sing this on TV? Will I lose fans? I think that was more of a, an actual headspace that we were in at the time. And what's cool is to, wa- to watch a song like that become like the theme song for March for Our Lives, the gun control movement, to watch so many people relate it to the, the Black Lives Matter movement. It's like, uh, yeah, totally. Of course, this can be uh, for you. It, it feels like maybe one of the more important songs we've ever written in terms of world impact. And it's interesting, too, because... It feels like not enough people are lending their voices to movements these days as they were in the 1960s because of kind of this fear of like 
corporate sponsorship rejecting things or I think there was an onion headline uh, of, about Bob Dylan the other day it was really funny it was like Bob Dylan not exactly rising to occasion as far as current protest music goes <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah I, I think it's uh, you know it's such a bigger conversation but the our country is so split right now it's everybody is just hearing the artists they want to hear and it's we're only headed more in that direction uh, with Twitter. Twitter, its algorithm is made so that you see people that you agree with. And so we're all kind of becoming in, in our own bubbles more and more. And it's I think it's an artist's job to break that bubble. It's an artist's job. If we have any fans that don't just that don't agree with us, it's our job to tell them how we feel because maybe we can make the world a, a better place or what we think the world is as a better place. Uh, Ryan, you, you have synesthesia, right? I do. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. I mean, as much as I know about it is just, um, you know, from that Pharrell Williams, Maggie Rogers exchange a few years ago and then, well, I mean, just LSD, you know, <laughs> but tell me a little bit about how that frames any musical choices you make. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've had this since I'm really young and I think I just recently discovered that not everybody <laughs> also has this. It's basically the the wires in your brain getting a little crossed. So some people can eat, you know, eat citrus and then see orange, uh, the color. Uh, uh, I have it where if I hear a certain sound, specifically musical sound, I will see a color or a shape. So I'll give you an example for something like week um, while we were working on it. So uh, the, the kick I see is this kind of big, dusty, brown, bumpy, uh, semicircle shape. And then I see uh, a lot of the strings as these like long legato purple waves. And so while we were making that song, I thought like, okay, what's the right snare drum for this song? Is it this like big 80s rock snare? No, because that I see like a big metallic uh, sphere. It No, it's got to be like a tight little snare that fits into the painting that I'm making essentially. So we went with a snare that when I hear it, I, I see this little wooden uh, spiked uh, half sphere. And that to me fits better in the painting of the song. So this this sounds very weird and probably makes no sense to most people. But um, I yeah, it it helps us kind of build the songs out. Oh, that's really cool. And does it also influence any of the band's visuals? Because I mean, your visual identity is definitely a, a unique thing. Yeah, a million percent. Yeah, but I mean, Bang has always been really red for us, and we knew the video had to be red. Uh, the album art is really important to us, and so we for something like the click. We looked at all the songs and we thought, okay, a lot of these songs feel purple, blue to us. Uh, a song like 330 feels, and I'm Not Famous, feels more amber, gold color. Let's make the album cover purple and gold. Let's let's really use these colors. Whether or not it means something directly to a fan. I see purple too, so I like this album. Obviously, that's not what they're thinking. It's more of just the subconscious uh, continuity. Hmm. And, and do, do you all dis discuss these things? Yeah. With each other? Yeah, I think a lot of times me and Jack are, are pretty aligned with the colors that w when we think of 330, we both yeah. think of white and gold, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Jack, tell me a little bit about when Ryan shares them with you. Is it uh, sort of like, well, whatever you say, brother, <laughs> or is it kind of, uh, oh, yeah, I get it? No, I definitely have it to a degree as well, which is actually really, you know, helpful for creating, you know, diversity among the album and for and I think that's honestly why Ryan and I work so well together because we do really align <laughs> in terms of all of those thoughts uh, I, I think it has to do with the fact that we've been working together for so long so mm -hmm. um it, it's, it's what makes it a really smooth process I think I think that if I didn't know what he was saying and I was like yeah I'll just go ahead it, it, it would be kind of frustrating to work together yeah when you are working together what are um your brothers you must have disagreements what what are most of the disagreements about um, I mean, we write and produce everything together, and when I guess when a problem comes up with writing, or it's never really an argument. It's more so. I think this is a catchier thing. I think this is a more relatable line. And eventually, we end up just kind of giving. We we share our case, and then we say, okay, let's try it out. And eventually, down the road, it ends up revealing that the person was wrong or you know or if that happens <laughs> like something happens where we'll play it for a couple people and they'll all say that okay wait i don't like that and we'll be like okay and, and i guess you were right let's move on but there's never like an all-out shouting match i think it, it, it gets pretty resolved it gets resolved pretty quick and it's also just due to we're definitely like perfect writing partners we're really on the same page a lot of the time when, when you are building a song what do you normally start with is it the chords and just 
singing? Yeah, it, it really is so random for us. It's truly anything. The, I'd say the most success we've had in terms of hits has all of them have come from a concept first. Uh, like Weak was the first thing we came up with was I'm weak and what's wrong with that. Um, and then I mean, same with Sober Up. Uh, you know, I, won't you help me sober up? I want to feel something again. That, that's when we're like, okay, let's write a song around that. And uh, that, that that's definitely in terms of like hit songs uh, or radio songs that we've had. But it really can be anything. We've written songs just based on a snare drum. We've written songs just based on a catchy melody, which is probably the hardest thing to do because you have to like fit in lyrics into a da-da-da-da-da, which is, you know, always difficult to do. Uh, but it really can be anything. It can be a movie we just saw. Like, wow, this Coen Brothers movie is like super weird and it made me think, you know, in this way, let's write a song with that feeling. You mentioned Sober Up. How, how did Rivers Cuomo get involved in that one? Rivers was a big fan of our song Week, which was kind of a single before that. Uh, and he heard it on Spotify, I think. And he wrote to us, he followed us. He's like, hey, I like the song. And I think that was where he expected to leave it. And us being, you know, big Weezer fans, we couldn't really leave it there. We had to shoot our shot there of, uh, you know, asking him to do something together. So we did. And he said, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do it. And we sent him over Sober Up, which was almost all written, everything except the bridge. And we said, wow, this is kind of perfect. You know, this is definitely our most, it's not, it doesn't really sound like a Weezer song, but if, if, if we were to pick one, it's definitely the most Weezer leaning. And uh, so we sent it to him and he loved the song and he sent back a bunch of options for bridges because we said, take a left turn. And he really did. He took a left turn for sure. A lot of the other options he sent were pretty wild and definitely wouldn't have fit in the song. But uh, the final one that he sent was, you know, my favorite color is you. And we were like, oh God, that's just, you know, that's just a match made in heaven. So we plopped it in and that was pretty much it. He, he, he's probably the most genius, nice guy we've met in the industry songwriting wise. He's just on another level. It's interesting too how, you know, we were talking a little bit about how anybody of any age could relate to some of these songs. And maybe it's just because your first hit had SpongeBob on it, but it felt like there's a youthful energy, but you're also not afraid to deal with like adult problems and, you know, talk about alcohol and drugs mm -hmm. in an honest way. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that like juxtaposition and irony is something that we found is really kind of untapped and unique in music there's a bunch of you know, there's a bunch of older artists like uh, uh loud and wayne right like 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 other 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 artists that were like a little more jokey and like were willing to kind of touch on multiple things um and we thought that let's definitely go down that road because we found it like really funny and exciting to you know create an exciting song uh saying i i, I i'm weak and what's wrong you know like in in the in the context of a party song we thought that was actually kind of funny and and, and unprecedented in, in in modern music so that's something that we fell in love with and we really go hard with that and we'd like to make the the fans sort of think a little bit during during these songs you know a song will start out and give a certain vibe and it'll be a sad song and then i'll start singing about how great my day is and it'll be like okay wait oh i thought the song was about this so we want to make the fans think as much as possible during our music what what do you think the future holds for AJR and and have you made a commitment to each other uh, that this is a long term thing? Will there be solo projects? There definitely will not be solo projects. <laughs> That's something we could say for sure. I think any of us getting up on stage by ourselves is. Probably our biggest nightmare, you know, oh, and, really? that, and that's not a joke. Absolutely. Ryan, can you imagine being alone on stage? We no. wouldn't know what to do. No, yeah. absolutely not. So much of the success, I think, is honestly the camaraderie that we have on stage. And I think the fans see that, you know, and they, and I think that's one of the reasons they like us a lot. Because, oh, wow, they're brothers. They get along and they joke around and I kind of see myself in them. And uh, if I had no one to do that with on stage, you know, just singing songs, I'd probably clam up. But in terms of other things, uh, we, we do a lot of music stuff outside the band. We, we write a lot for other artists as well. And I've done a lot of that in the past. That's something that we love to do to get into another, you know, headspace of a, of a Jason Derulo or a, you know, Justin, never written for Justin Bieber, but that would be fun. Um, uh, and uh, also we're, uh, we write a lot of music for a film as well. Basically, uh, we have a, a few of films are coming out with songs that we have in there, just even in the background or in the, you know, in the credits. And uh, we're also working on a Broadway show, actually, a big, ex a big producer approached us. Uh, he was a fan of our music and he asked us if we had any ideas and we gave him and we're currently working on that. Oh, cool. Are yeah. we talking like jukebox musical or, or the story of these three brothers? No, not our story at all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, no, totally, that's, totally new. Yeah, that's kind of what attracted us to the ideas because, wow, we could tell someone else's story. It's something I know we have the ability to do, but it just feels wrong. With HR, we just want to be as... Uh, honest as possible and autobiographical as possible here's a chance to tell a story about this is not what the story is but about a guy in prison you know and really get into his uh frame of mind yeah how do you when when you are writing for somebody else how do you get in that headspace and find the balance between 
expressing yourself and writing something that another person can do. I mean, if you're in the room with the artists, it's a lot about just getting deep into a therapy session with them, honestly, and, and trying to create a very comfortable environment. If they can't be comfortable to like really get real with you, then you're probably not going to write a very good song or it'll be pretty generic. Um, so a lot of the uh, uh, songs that we've written for other artists have come from, hey, like, what are you feeling now? How are you doing? How's your family? You know, and if they're like, oh, I'm really stressed out, man. It's like, okay, great. What are you stressed out about? Let's write a song. That's, that's money right there. That's, that, that's a song. We already have it. Um, and then, so there's that side. And then also we used to, for a long time, used to just pitch songs to hundreds and hundreds of artists. We would write songs specifically for Jason Derulo, specifically for Kygo. And that's just like straight up fun. That's just like, okay, like, Jason Derulo, let's like do a little bit of research. What's his life like? Where does he live? What does he do? Like, what is he probably thinking about now? Like, you know, and we were trying to get in that mind space and just write the ultra Jason Derulo song. We have a, so many songs on our hard drive that eventually we'll end up just like probably putting out and being like, check out this song we wrote for five seconds of summer, you know, and, and see what fans think. But that, that was such a hilarious uh, part of, uh, of, of our career back then. Yeah. Well, tell me about the first time you did end up working with him, you know, af after all that writing of fan fiction, basically. Oh, we never ended up working in person. We we uh, we actually had a song that he was really interested with at the label that he actually didn't end up cutting. But because uh, oh, actually okay. he said, they said we, we wrote this like really we, we thought was a great Jason Derulo song. And then we, we sent it in and his label was like, yeah, I love this, but he would never say this thing in the verse. That's totally not Jason. We were like, oh, shit, I guess I don't know Jason Derulo at all. <laughs> you know? um, so, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. but we, we ended up, we, we had a bunch of songs. We have a bunch of songs that came out from other artists. We, we wrote a bunch of Andy Grammer's uh, singles. We wrote yeah. for Max. Yeah. Megan, Megan we have a couple of songs with Megan Trainor. Yeah, out. and those are really fun. It's, it's really fun to be in the room with the artists too. And it, like what Jack was saying, it's really fun to be on your own, but it's also fun to just like... Uh, play off of them and, and try to nudge them in a certain direction. Like, Oh, what if you tried being a folk artist or what if you tried putting this hat on of like the, the more, uh, more hip hop sounding it's, it's fun to be their uh, life coach for a second, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me about the, who, who was your first session with that you uh, were, were in the room with? Um, it was Andy Grammer. It was yeah, alone, Andy Grammer. Right? Yeah. yeah uh, I went to LA. I actually stayed with Andy Grammer at his house um, I was 19 at the time and, uh, it was fun. I just, I'm, I'm proud of myself. I was, I was very nervous, but I, I feel like I was very brave, uh, to just go. I had never really come into contact with a celebrity before, like anybody that was in any way famous. And so to go there and to, I, I think something I did that was really great is that I wasn't just like a yes man. I wasn't just like, Oh, what, what do you want to do? Okay. I'll, I'll do that. I think I came in with a lot of weird ideas and a lot of them he didn't like, and some of them he did like, I, and that's probably something I would recommend to other uh, co-writers, you'll be remembered more and you'll be invited back if you were the guy that or the girl that came up with interesting, weird ideas, even if they were too weird for the session, you'll be invited back because it's like, oh, what other crazy, quirky ideas do you have? That, that really is good advice. If you weren't doing music, what would you be doing? Um, definitely film. Ryan and I both went to a film school up at, up at Columbia. So uh, that's definitely where, where our mind is. I've, I've been writing, you know, screenwriting for a really long time. And we're, there's a Oh yeah, we 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 also have an agent that's in the middle of you know working on a uh, TV show actually that we wrote about touring uh, from from our experiences. So definitely something in that arena. Hopefully, is gonna you know come out soon. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, Did, is it is it at all? Ho hopefully, it's better than that roadies show. Did you see that's that? That's so funny. I never saw the roadies show, and every time someone reads it, the the script. I, I, this is so annoying. It's 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 really just my friends and the agent and all that stuff. They're like, oh, this is definitely better than the roadies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's funny. Yeah, because like all our whole crew watched roadies, um, and they were like, yeah, roadies was such because like it wasn't a realistic interpretation of touring, but I, we've been doing it for such a long time. Every you know, right. so we included the most minute all the minutia of like, oh yeah, I'm totally been through that and been through that so hopefully we got it right what is it that keeps you in music uh so firmly uh as opposed to like ditching it all and pursuing the screenwriting oh um we have a lot of fans <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and we, and we love it honestly we like doing we like uh, it's it's a scary thing to think about music just getting so you know conformist and just everyone kind of putting out the exact same sound over and over and over again. That's a really scary thing. And so we really want to just try to be an artist. And there's, there's definitely a few out there that just keeps putting out something weird and something newer and trying to keep music from becoming so solid and one sounded, you know, so that, that, that's really important to us. AJR always looking to do something weird and something newer. 
and they will be performing that special interactive show that I mentioned at the top of this episode and that they mentioned throughout the course of our interview on December 26th. It is called One Spectacular Night, the immersive concert live stream. Visit onespectacularnight.com for more info. And if you happen to be listening to this episode on the Take Note site, online.berkeley.edu slash take note, then you will see the trailer for the concert is embedded below, and it looks really cool. So visit onespectacularnight.com for more info. And if you want more info on saving 100 bucks on a Berkeley online course, you will want to visit musicismylifepod.com for a special discount that's available only to you because you listen to this podcast. Not only that, but because you listen through the credits of this podcast. So check it out, musicismylifepod.com. And as far as those credits go, let me tell you about all the people who are involved in making the Music Is My Life podcast possible, or at least all the people who work on it. This episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered by Jose David Vindis Mora. All visual assets coordinated by Mike De Benedictus. Social media by Brooke Larson. Web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, and Joe McDonough. Thanks to our video team who posts these episodes on YouTube two weeks after they premiere on podcast services. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Ashley Pointer, Amanda Brophy, Madison Wolf, Carlene Donovan, Danelle and Tom Ellis, and thanks to you for listening. Join us on Monday, December 21st, our last episode of 2020 for special guest Kate Stables, who also goes by the moniker This Is The Kit. Stay safe, listeners, and stay inspired. <laughs>